Hello! Welcome to Archival Adventures. I'm Anthony Wright de Hernandez, uh, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, and um, this is the stream. Uh, <laughs> before I uh, dive in, I just have uh, some acknowledgments to do. These are, um, this is official language from Virginia Tech. Um, it is a, a land and labor acknowledgement that I do think is very important, so I like to do it at the beginning of every uh, episode, so every week. Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tutelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with, the land, with their land and waterways. Uh, we further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through their forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tutelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, divers diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through Inclusive VT, the institutional indi individual commitment to ut pro sim that I may serve in the, spirit of the, in the spirit of community diversity and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. <clears throat> so uh, that is much more explicit language than uh, they used to have in the past, and I do think that it is important to express those sentiments at the beginning of every stream. So um, that is, that's why I read it. Also, um, <coughs> yeah, uh, this being an archives show and focused on the history of the world, essentially, depending on whatever I pull out, um, I do think it's important to acknowledge that history is not great. Um, and I will note for anybody watching that um, you may encounter materials as we're looking at the, the archives that may contain um, objectionable sentiments. Uh, these are historic documents and I don't pre-screen what I share on the stream because usually it's a collection I have no experience with. Um, so if we do encounter something, I just want to uh, warn you ahead of time. Uh, now that that is out of the way, <clears throat> Today we're going to be revisiting the Marjorie Rhodes Townsend papers. I will read her biography from our site uh, just shortly, but first let me say welcome um, to everybody viewing on twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios and everybody viewing on twitch.tv slash Rogan27. Um, I have VTUL Studios on this computer over here and Rogan27 on this computer over here. So if I'm looking back and forth, it's because I'm trying to monitor chat in both places. Um, Fluid Ann, welcome. Uh, Hannah, hello. <laughs> and Lord Portico, how are you today? Uh, Fluid Ann, thank you for the resubscription with Prime. Um, yes, you are on this computer over here, Lord Portico. <clears throat> that said, I'm now going to make it so I can't see the chat from the Rogan27 channel very briefly while I read the, uh, uh, the bio for Marjorie Townsend. Um, also, hi, Key Squared try to resist the temptation to type half a sentence in each chat. Oh, that would, um, that would make me dizzy, I think. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna look away for a second from the chat and read this bio. Uh, for anybody who wasn't here last week and anybody uh, who isn't familiar or just doesn't remember, Marjorie Rhodes Townsend, born in 1930, entered the George Washington University Engineering Program at the age of 15. She took classes part-time and worked full-time after her marriage to Dr. Charles Townsend in 1948 and was the first woman to earn an engineering degree at GWU, uh, receiving her Bachelor of Electrical Engineering in 1951. Her career began with eight years at the Naval Research Laboratory where she worked on sonar research. In 1959, she moved to National Aeronautics and Space Administration's Goddard Space Flight Center where she worked until 1980. 
Noted for her project management skills, Townsend oversaw three satellite launches from foreign locations. Uh, she was project manager for all three small astronomy satellites, 1966 to 1975, and for the Applications Explorer missions, 1975 to 76. She was granted a patent for a digital telemetry system that was ab aboard the Nimbus satellite. Her last five years at NASA included responsibility for all advanced mission planning for future scientific and, uh, sorry, I stumbled over that sentence. Let me try again. Her last five years at NASA included responsibility for all advanced mission planning for future scientific and applications satellites, as well as NOAA's meteorological satellites. After her retirement, Townsend worked for private aerospace companies and provided consulting services to NASA and other aerospace entities. Townsend was awarded the NASA Exceptional Service Medal in 1971 and the NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal in 1980. She was also named Knight of the Italian Republic Order in 1972. She's a fellow of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers and served as a chair of the Washington chapter. She also served as chairman of the National Capital Section of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics and is a past president of the Washington Academy of Sciences. <clears throat> so we have her papers in our collections and um, Today we actually have both boxes, which is great. Last week we did not have box one because it was being used for a class. If you want to take a look at the finding aid um, and you see anything that stands out as something you'd like to see, I just dropped the link in chat on Rogan27 and give me one second, I will drop it in chat over on VTUL Studios. Hi KJ McLean, greetings to you. Uh, how is the east coast of Canada doing? Give me one second and I will have the link to the finding aid on the VTUL Studios channel. I was not prepared. I was prepared, I just wasn't prepared to do the link on both computers for some reason. Uh, but we'll get there, we'll get there. Okay, that link will take you to the finding aid, which um, has the bio that I just read, as well as some information about what's in the collection, as well as a listing um, by folder of kind of what is there. So um, as I st start pulling things out and we start looking at documents, um, if you see something listed on the finding aid that you're interested in seeing on camera, uh, let me know and I will share it. Um, and. I do see Lord Portico some sneaky shenanigans. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so, I think it's time to uh, grab some papers. And see what we have. You know, I'm just gonna grab the first range of folders here um, and we'll take a look at stuff. And then, like I said, if, if something stands out and you wanna see it, let me know. Cause I can jump ahead. Uh, but since I don't really know what's in the collection, <laughs> um, just pulling documents out and looking at them seems like a good way to explore. All right, this first folder is Townsend's resume. Might be interesting, might be boring. If it's boring, we move on. Ooh. I apologize. I have knocked the camera pretty badly. I will try to stop things from shaking. <clears throat> so we have her business card here. Marjorie R. Townsend, PE, 
consulting in spacecraft systems and project management. It's a very simple white card. Two-page resume, 10-page curriculum vitae <clears throat> in a little spirally bound booklet. Everybody does their stuff online now. I, I never, <clears throat> I think I must have done paper resumes at some point, but I honestly can't remember the last time I had to do a, an actual like paper resume. <clears throat> Two page resume. Marjorie R. Townsend. I'm not going to read the whole resume. That would, that would probably be a little boring, but we'll look at highlights here. Bachelor of Electrical Engineering, 1951 from GWU, and we know from her bio um, that she was, what was it, the first woman to receive that degree from that school? Yes. I was reading it, not listening to it before. So she was the first woman to receive uh, an engineering degree from George Washington University. <clears throat> Specialties, systems design and analysis, technical project management, long range planning, spacecraft systems, ground systems, and electronics. Marjorie Townsend's experience ranges over more than 30 years from experimental research in anti-submarine warfare to spacecraft systems design and the successful management of three NASA, NASA space projects. Expect, except for a period from March 1983 until July 1984, she has been a private consultant in space and ground systems since retiring from NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in November 1980. So this resume is from after her retirement. <clears throat> She's Vice President of Space Systems Development for Space America. I am not familiar with Space America. What is Space America? If somebody wants to look that up and drop, in, drop some info for me, I will, I'd be happy to learn. Her responsibilities included the design, development, fabrication, and testing of a spacecraft bus and the solid state land remote sensing instruments it was to carry as well as the associated ground station for controlling and acquiring data from the satellite. Huh. Small astronomy satellites, which we know about. We know that they were all launched from Kenya. Earlier, she had served as a consultant to the French on their EOLE satellite program for data collection from space. She also coordinated the use of the interrogation recording and location system, the first space data collection system flown. <coughs> Pardon me while I cough. <coughs> um, this is kind of weird to me, but I'm not sure what was the date on this resume. Circa 1985. Um, a woman who is very clearly uh, an expert in her field and has a serious career behind her, including in her resume that uh, who she is married to and information about their children and grandchildren. Um, that just seems really odd to me, but I suppose at that time it probably made sense as a woman, a career woman, to include information about family. <clears throat> so then we have her, hello Scraff, how are you? We have her 10-page CV, uh, which, you know, George Washington University is where she got her degree. And the fact that she had such, an, such a career 
with just a bachelor's degree. Like this, it, to do the work that she did on these space flight systems today, she would probably have needed a doctorate. <clears throat> but uh, just a bachelor's degree. She has her education and then she has her patent listed. Digital telemetry system, patent number 3,380,042, dated April 23rd, 1968. I'm doing pretty good, Scraff. Um, <clears throat> it's a bit dry in here, so I I'm, I'm keep clearing my throat and I apologize for that. But otherwise, I'm doing fine. <clears throat> I have uh, the first box of the same collection we looked at last week, where last week we didn't have the first box. Um, plus, there's just a ton of stuff. I don't think I'm going to flip through her entire 10-page CV. I think we'll move on to the next folder um, and see what else we have. I just thought the first thing in there. Might as well take a look at it. Ah, the next thing we have are her the photos of her getting her award. Photos of Townsend accepting Knight of the Italian Republic Order. <clears throat> so hopefully these will be visible and I won't be won't have to take them out of the plastic, but I can take them out of the plastic if the glare is uh, making it impossible to see the entire thing or I just would prefer to leave them inside their little plastic sheet because then I don't have to put on the gloves and deal with all of that. Um, but here she is holding the Knight of the Italian Republic Order. Uh, I probably do mean manuscripts. I don't know, Scrap. I. I don't know what I said that prompted the question. Yeah, right now, this one, uh, the glare is off on the side, and there's not really important information in that part of the picture. But she's, uh... Oh. Yeah, I have, um... So this, co this collection, this manuscript collection, is four boxes with multiple folders in each... So um, last week we just had boxes two, three, and four, and this week we have box one, uh, which last week was being used in a class um, at the time of the stream, so I wasn't able to bring it. Um, let's see. So this was 1972, and she received this award, or this honor, um, I'm not sure what Knight of the Italian Republic Order is, but I mean, it's a knighthood in Italy. Uh, but other than that, I don't really know. Um, whole big group of men. <laughs> With her, I don't know if she's reading her acceptance there or something. It doesn't seem like a big like formal thing. Huh. Here they're actually giving it to her, I think. It looks like they're handing her the certificate <clears throat> rather than like the actual medal itself in this photo. Uh, you know, I have no idea why he's wearing <clears throat> sunglasses. They they certainly seem somewhat informal. <laughs> and here she is getting the actual like uh, award itself, the medallion. I don't believe this collection has the actual medal in it. 
um, some of our other NASA related collections have actual like um, like the actual like ribbons and and whatnot. I don't think this one does, uh, but the finding aid would say if it does. It's very interesting, this, this setting for giving her the award. Um, so this guy in this photo has just tinted glasses, but in the big group photo, there is somebody that did have sunglasses. Um, here, I'll, I'll, the person second from the right actually has sunglasses on in this photo. So I don't know why. 1972, maybe it had something to do with fashion. Maybe he just like wearing dark glasses. Maybe he just came inside. I, I don't know. <laughs> um, but this guy who seems to be the person in charge, whose name I don't, I don't know. Uh, he seems, he just has the tinted glasses that were common in the 70s. It'd be, it'd be nice if we had the actual names. Um, and these appear to be official photographs. They have um, control numbers at the bottom from the Goddard Space Flight Center. So it's probably, they're probably, um, among a set of publicity photos from NASA. So it's probably actually possible to get the names. Uh, I just don't have them here in front of me at the moment. Um, but the publicity photos that NASA put out would come with a sheet of paper that had actual like captions for the photos. Um, those are just missing in this collection. Well, at least two of them are smiling. So many of the people in these photos are not smiling. She's, she's there with a wall of men in front of her and they're just, they all look grumpy. It was a lot more expensive to have multiple sets of glasses and uh, reactolites were new then. So the just come indoors thing is possible. Thank you, just, just Here for Coffee. That is good information that I did not know. I didn't know that like transitions type lenses were even a thing in the 70s. Here, here he is actually pinning the medal on her for her Italian knighthood. Um, I would be very curious to actually see like her acceptance speech, which it's possible might be in here, um, or like a press release or some announcement of specifically why she was given an Italian knighthood. Um, it just seems odd that it was Italy. I don't know. I There was on the um, Small Astronomy Satellites project, uh, I believe she did work with a place in Italy the, and the Italian like version of NASA. Um, so that's probably why, but it'd be interesting to know. So I think that's like all the photos that are in the collection. I think everything else is documents. Uh, but we'll continue exploring and find out. Let's see what we have here. The Life and Achievements of Dr. Robert H. Goddard, Special Engineering Co Colloquium at Goddard Space Flight Center. It's a booklet. So this, this doesn't have anything to do specifically with Marjorie, but I don't know who Goddard is. I know he has a space flight center named after him. 
some art of him. A statement from his wife. Hmm. I'm looking to see there's a lot of stuff here on like his early history. He from Massachusetts talks about where he went to high school. Her preamble to it was his his work is so well known, I'm not going to focus on that, which doesn't help me, uh, who is not especially conversant with who Goddard was and what his work was that he got his space flight center named after him for. So I'm, I'm poking through trying to see, think of this future, you strange authors. Well, I mean, it was his wife, so. <laughs> aware of the beauties of nature fruitful years of full-time experimentation financed by the Guggenheim family he was an extremely happy man <laughs> if somebody knows what uh what Goddard did that got the Sp Space Flight Center named after him, I would be interested to know. He invented the liquid-fueled rocket, arguably the father of rocketry worldwide. Thank you. Because I did not know that. Um, so we have a couple copies of this engineering colloquial, colloquium uh, and a talk about him by his wife. The first time there was a rocket engine you, you could turn on and off rather than just a solid fuel that you lit and it ran. George Washington University Alumni Achievement Award Program and Article. Articles and clippings about Marjorie. Tiros and Pam system. A medium data range telemetry system for the PTG set meeting. I think Let's glance quickly at the articles about her, uh, but the other stuff seems more interesting. That's why I said quickly. We'll glance quickly. They're laminated. This is from the Evening Star and Daily News, Washington, DC, Wednesday, March 7th, 1973. Award winner, six outstanding career women in government last night received the Federal Woman's Award at the 13th Annual Banquet at the Sheridan Hotel. Mrs. Marjorie Townsend of the Goddard Space Flight Center, a winner, chats with NASA Administrator James Fletcher. The Washington Post obituary says she got the knighthood for her work in joint U.S.-Italian space missions, like the Uhuru satellite. So Uhuru was the first of the small astronomy satellites. Um, thank you, Key Squared. It is interesting that it was a joint, all three of those satellites were joint operations between NASA and the Italian Space Flight Center, and they all launched out of Kenya. In, in Africa. We have a newspaper article here. 
stars in her eyes. Marjorie Rhodes Townsend is the only woman in the free world to be project manager of a satellite program. She's also a manager of a family that includes her physician husband, four sons, two Siamese cats, three Irish setters, and a small printing business. Yet she has stars in her eyes. Some stars, she says, are invisible. They're so dense, they pull photons of light back inside by gravitation. Those are called black holes. Then there are pulsars, stars that vary in intensity, most of them periodically, and they pulsate. It's difficult to realize that soft-spoken girlish Mrs. Townsend at 42 is responsible for the inception, design, construction, and testing of NASA's small astronomy satellites. Or that the first SAS launched two years ago in search of stars that radiate X-rays in this and other galaxies already has made a major impact on science. I, w I wonder what year this is from. It, I don't have the date on this one unless it's on the back somewhere. It, it is not. That was called Uhuru, an African word for freedom, because it was launched off the coast of Kenya. Data from Uhuru alone has revolutionized high-energy astronomy, she says proudly. The second SAS was launched last November in search of stars that radiate gamma rays. Orbiting that, uh, orbiting that one involved Mrs. Townsend... I'm going to try that one more time. Orbiting that one involved Mrs. Townsend and her staff with the University of Rome and was the first American satellite to be launched by another country, Italy. A third SAS is scheduled for launch in 1975. She was the first woman to receive an engineering degree of any kind from George Washington University here, and she won that degree while holding down a full-time job at the National Bureau of Standards to help her husband through medical school. She and Charles Townsend, now a successful obstetrician, were married when she was 18 and in her junior year at the university where he was a medical student. Both Townsends received their degrees in 1951 and Marjorie went to work at the Na Naval Research Laboratory here as a junior electrical engineer. Eight years later, she was a senior engineer to the Airborne Sonar Branch. January 1973, El Paso Herald. Thank you, Key Squared. Girlish at 42. The casual sexism is strong. Yes, Simsilica. <laughs> uh, they were reprinting it, though. I, I mean, it's possible it was an AP uh, source. The author actually... Uh, essentially somewhat similar to Associated Press. This is from Scripps, Ca Scripps Howard. Um, the author... Uh, Wohilao Lahey um, was writing for Scripps Howard. Which, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Scripps Howard would, have, would be something equivalent to what we know as the Associated Press today. But I am not certain because, honestly, I was not aware of Scripps Howard before reading this and seeing it. So... I'm just speculating on that. And you're welcome to look it up and let me know what Scripps Howard was. Uh, the photo credit is UPI. She went to work for NASA in 1959 to direct design of the ground data processing system for the Tiros 2 weather satellite. That led to her present job at the Goddard Space Flight Center in nearby Greenbelt. Being the wife of a busy physician and mother of four sons would have stopped most women's careers, but not Marjorie's. Ours is a 50-50 marriage, she says. If Charles and I didn't have a perfect understanding, I'd be cheer or careerless and thwarted. Uh, while she is not active in women's liberation, she points to her life as an example of a truly liberated woman. Marjorie has proved, she thinks, that women can have happy marriages, children, and well-functioning homes, and full-time, top-level demanding jobs. Her four sons prove her point. Oh, remember at the top of stream when I mentioned that we may encounter objectionable content? Uh, these are historic documents presented as is. Um, wow, her four sons prove her point. Charles Jr., known as Chet, is almost 20. He's transferring from George Washington University to the University of Florida at Gainesville to study citrus culture because the family bought a 40-acre citrus grove near Ocala and he wants to run it. 
Lewis, 19, is a sophomore at GWU and plans to be a pediatrician. John, 18, also at GWU, will go to Florida next term because he wants to be a doctor and practice in that state. All three, their mother says, are victims of the DC school system, which is not able to prepare students for college. They all took night classes to augment their daytime high school work. Richard, the youngest, is in a local Episcopal boys' school. Mickey and Cindy are the Siamese cats. Patrick, Jackie, and Sally Second are the Irish setters. The Townsends will celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary in June by watching which Richard emulate his brothers by becoming an Eagle Scout. The Townsend household is so well managed it's difficult to realize so much is going on. Marjorie is proud. The boys cater all our parties and they can all cook. She says, Chet does magnificent pastry, Lewis is a real gourmet chef, John has a way with hamburgers, and Richard can make anything. They're really amazing. A family sideline is printing. Years ago, we gave Chet a toy printing press. We all got interested, and when we found a printer going out of business, we bought all his equipment. Well, one thing led to another, and now we're in business. We can do almost any printing job down here. We mix our own ink to match anything. We spend all our spare time and all our weekends down here. But the fact her household runs so smoothly is not why Marjorie won a special award last year. That was NASA's 1972 Exceptional Service Medal for Outstanding Technical and Managerial Leadership. It was in recognition of the stars in her eyes. She worked to pay both their ways through school. Yeah. Oh, key squared. Uh... <laughs> No problem. If you make it back later, I will see you then. Otherwise, I'll see you another time. 20, 19, 18. It doesn't say how young the youngest is, but yeah, they, they, honestly, I don't think that was too unusual to have multiple children in quick succession, um, given when she would have been having kids. So... Yeah, that article is definitely from the 1970s. It's sometime between, uh, while we don't have an exact date, <clears throat> it is sometime between the launch of the second SAS satellite and the third SAS satellite. So I don't know the exact date of when the second one launched. I would have to look it up. Um, Oh, let's see. The third one was supposed to launch in 1975, according to this article. The first one launched in 1970. NASA SASB. Oh my. One second. I'm still looking for the date of when SAS 2 or SAS B launched. <clears throat> ah, here we go. 1972. So this article is from between 1972 and 1975. Uh, while I was looking at that, I came across <clears throat> I came across something on uh, where is it on science.org that is a scan of an article. The, the title of which is NASA Satellite Project, The Boss is a Woman, from 1973. I don't think that one is in this uh, set of clippings. We'll find out. But oh my, that's, that's why I, I got distracted for a second. Article is from 1972, yeah. Okay.
six women to get federal awards. And she's there. Let's see what else we have. Goddard News, January 25th, 1980. Townsend joins DC Board of Professional Engineers. District of Columbia's Mayor Marion Barry. Wow. Remember Mayor Marion Barry? I do. Uh, congratulates Marjorie Townsend, manager of Goddard's Preliminary Systems Design Group, uh, following her oath of office on January 9th to serve on the district district's Board of Professional Engineers. Mrs. Townsend is the first woman to serve on this board. In addition to this honor, she recently has been elected a fellow of the Institute of Electrical en and Electronics Engineers, effective as of January 1st. Wow. Marion Barry looks really young there. <laughs> Sorry, I grew up in the DC area, so I, I definitely remember Mayor Marion Barry. I don't know if, I've, if he's as prominent a figure for other people. Um, let's see, Goddard News. Oh, this is the same, same article that we just saw. Oh, we do, we have that one. Oh, joy. This is the one that I just ran across on the internet when I was searching for the date from uh, Science Magazine. Science, American Association for the Advancement of Science. 5 January 1973, volume 179, number 4068. NASA Satellite Project. The boss is a woman. Marjorie Rhodes Townsend has a history of precocity. Oh my. I mean, the title alone was bad. They start off by saying she has a history of precocity. Oh dear. Uh, she entered college at the age of 15, married at 18, and became the first woman to receive an engineering degree from George Washington University in Washington, D.C. She is one of the few women at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration holding a GS-15 job, and now at 42, is the only woman in the whole free world, in quotes, um, who is project manager for a satellite program. Since 1966, Townsend has been project manager for NASA's Small Astronomy Satellite Project, with headquarters at the Goddard Space Flight Center at Greenbelt, Maryland. The SAS program is a joint Italian-American venture, which involves the launching, of over f uh, the launching over a five-year period of three satellites designed to locate and map sources of X-rays and gamma rays in this and other galaxies. X-ray astronomy has delivered objects un unidentifiable by radio or optical astronomy, or has discovered objects unidentifiable ra by radio or optical astronomy and furnishes new information on objects such as pulsars and black holes. NASA designs the experiments and supplies the satellites. The Italians supply at the launch facilities and person personnel at San Marco, a platform built in the Indian Ocean off the coast of Kenya. The first two satellites have already been successfully launched. SASA, better known as Uhuru, was the world's first X-ray astronomy satellite. Propelled into orbit in December 1970, it has supplied scientists with a wealth of new and unexpected data on X-ray sources and has, according to project scientist Carl Fichtel, opened up the whole field of high-energy astronomy. It also brought honors to Marjorie Townsend who last year was awarded NASA's Exceptional Service Medal for her outstanding technical and managerial leadership of the SAS program. She wryly acknowledges that had the satellite fizzled, that very same, manage very same managerial ability undoubtedly would have gone unrewarded. Townsend recently returned from Kenya, where she supervised the successful launching of SASB, which is supposed to detect gamma rays, which have energy frequencies 1,000 times greater than X-rays, with unprecedented se sensitivity and precision. She is now at work planning for the last of the series, which is scheduled to continue X-ray surveys when it is launched in 1975. All the satellites are boosted into equatorial orbits to avoid interference with the radiation belts. 
<clears throat> Townsend is not an astronomer, but an electrical engineer and manager. She is responsible for the inception, design, construction, and testing of the satellites as well as launches themselves. Uh, she has to see to it that the design of the craft carries out the concept of the experiment and that the whole thing will fly. While her project is embedded in NASA structure, her immediate supervisor is the chief of the Explorer Projects Office. She has considerable authority. Only John Clark, director of Goddard, can veto a project manager's design. Marjorie Townsend has an open, somewhat girlish appearance. And manager... Oh, God. What? And manner, sorry. Has an open, somewhat girlish appearance and manner, which does not detract from the obvious fact that she is a woman who knows what she's doing. She exudes buoyant spirits and firm self-confidence. No one gets to walk on her. Cigarette smoking is hazardous to my health, warns a sign in her office, which is filled with citations, photographs, and satellite models. Getting into a career in engineering was a natural course for the young Marjorie. She was one of those lucky girls who grew up taking it for granted that being a female imposed no, in no restrictions on her. Uh, this was largely due to the attitude of her father, who expected me to do great things, an expectation probably enhanced by the fact that she was an only child. Her father was a mechanical engineer in the sales and service department of a heating company in Washington, as well as an inventor of sorts who held several patents on humidity control devices for railroad heating and cooling systems. Did they just segue into crediting her father for her, for her success? Because I think they just segued into crediting her father for her success. <clears throat> Good, I'm glad somebody else uh, recognized that with me. Her father encouraged her to study engineering, which even now probably has the smallest proportion of women of any technical field, and she herself found it attractive because it offered a nice combination of both science and mathematics, and no history to, uh, to which she has a personal aversion. In 1948, during her junior year at George Washington, she met and married Charles Townsend, when a medical uh, then a medical student and now a Washington obstetrician. She quit her full-time studies for a job at the National Bureau of Standards and worked her husband's way through, through medical school. She stopped going to school and got a job so that he could work his so that she could pay for him to go to medical school meanwhile she attended night school when they both received their degrees in 1951 she went to work at the naval research laboratory in washington during her eight years there she worked her way up from a gs5 junior engineer to one of the 10 youngest gs12s there senior engineers in the airborne sonar branch of the sound division she also found time to bear four sons. Working with a woman who could have four babies without ever having to take a leave without pay was quite an education for her bosses. She should not have had to do that to impress them. Uh, having a baby is a major medical uh, a major medical procedure and a major major life event, you shouldn't be expected to work through that. Oh my. <laughs> oh, some silica, they paid her. They just, um, they wouldn't have paid her had she taken leave. So... She bore four, four children without ever taking time off without pay. <clears throat> Whew. The first two times, she says they assumed she wouldn't be coming back. The third time, they began to believe it. And the fourth time, they kept giving me more work up to the time I actually had to go to the hospital. 
Townsend, ever hungry for more responsibility, went to work for NASA in 1959, where she directed the design of the ground data processing system for the Tiros 2 weather satellite. For anyone looking for greener pastures, NASA was the logical place to transfer, she says, since NRL was the birthpla birthplace of NASA. She ja bleh. She gradually shifted from working with hardware to management, and eventually became technical assistant to the chief of Goddard Systems Division. This job, however, was not sufficiently challenging. So when the SAS project manager job opened up, she applied for it. She was selected because of her broad background in spacecraft requirements and spacecraft telemetry systems, as well as her ability, as she says, to get the job done. Townsend is not modest about her achievements, which range from being a uh, co-inventor of a digital telemetry system to being a merit badge counselor for the Boy Scouts. She doesn't drink and is a member of the Daughters of the American Revolution. Throughout her career, Townsend has impressed colleagues with her energy and devotion to her job. Any doubts we had about females were rapidly dispelled, says her first superior or supervisor at NRL. She is described as methodical, well-organized, highly, highly intelligent, and a top-notch engineer. Her natural and outgoing manner have also made her well-liked, despite the fact that she has inevitably had to step on some toes on her way up. Her first boss at NASA says emphatically, she likes to be considered one of the boys. At the same time, says another colleague, she brings to the job the feminine qualities of engineering. For example, some of the sloppy men in her office at NRL were awed by the foresightedness and precision she brought to the process of packing for field trips. <laughs> the, the fact that this hasn't changed significantly in many tech fields in the last 50 years. Yeah, key squared. <laughs> um, and yeah, just here for coffee, it's the U.S. healthcare system and the U.S. corporate system and government and everything. They just don't believe in letting women have bodies that give birth to babies and taking care of them when they do that. Sorry, just getting slightly political in my statement there, but it's also true. We are so focused on everybody has to be at work all the time that we're not... Uh, our system is not set up to let women take time off to have a baby. <laughs> Hi, Millie Glitch. <laughs> <clears throat> Townsend, perhaps because of her extensive experience with obstetricians, seems to have a sort of ma uh, maternal approach toward her satellites. She had... What? Her extensive experience with obstetricians because she had four babies and is married to an obstetrician? And what does that have to do with a maternal approach towards satellites? I don't understand what you're saying, Science Magazine. Uh, she has several, several times remarked that the chances of launching a perfect satellite are about equivalent to the chances of having a perfect baby. That is, uh, it's a miracle because of all the things that can go wrong. Her husband does not, in turn, tell prospective mothers that their chances of having normal babies are about the same as having a successful SAS launch. As Townsend admits, human nature is more likely to foul up than nature itself, so the comparison is not statistically valid. <laughs> it's not set up for people to take time off in general. Yes, that is true. We Just here for coffee, yeah, the article is... it's really working hard to praise the men around her rather than giving her direct compliments. Um, Townsend says that budget shrinkage at NASA has reduced the margin of error to practically nothing. The SAS program annual budget has vacillated between $5 million and $9 million. A cutback this year has meant delays in the fabrication of SASC. Nonetheless, results have been spectacular so far. The Italians are evidently happy with the way the cooperation is going. In October, in a ceremony in Rome, they bestowed upon her the Knight of the Italian Republic Order. One suspects that the honor is as much inspired by her ability to relate to people as well as to manage them. 
The Italian crew at San Marco took it upon themselves to build her a little house at the base camp so that she could be on hand at all times during launch preparations. And one official told her that she was the first NASA person they had met who had taken the trouble to learn some Italian. Townsend says she has no ear for languages, but she struggled bravely through an acceptance speech in Italian upon, re uh, upon receiving her prize. Townsend, unlike some successful women who think women's lib is the product of a bunch of malcontents, believes there is room for improvement in male attitudes towards professional women. She herself believes she has been very lucky, very much more fortunate than most women. Uh, asked if colleagues looked askance at her infiltration of NASA, virtually a stag outfit at upper levels, she says not askance so much as amazed most of the time. She is distinctly unparanoid about masculine attitudes. It has to hit me over the head that a person is prejudiced. She says she does not run into a certain amount of she says she does run into a certain amount of stereotyping. As an example, she said that when a woman renders a judgment about something, men call it female intuition. Whereas if the pronouncement comes from a man, it is an educated guess. But she adds, I don't get that from troops that work for me. Her staff includes a secretary, a spacecraft manager, a project operations director, an experiment manager, a coordinator. All but the secretary are male, and she says that unfortunately they do get a certain amount of kidding for having a female boss. Townsend thinks the reason so few women go into engineering is quite simply that engineering is not socially acceptable for girls. She recalled that 10 years ago, one of her sons asked her to give a talk to his fifth grade class on the meteorological satellite program. She brought a model and uh, she brought a model and gave a lecture followed by a question and answer period that lasted 45 minutes. Boys and girls were equally curious, but sometime later she says she gave a talk at a junior high school. No girls were present. Townsend thinks that technical interests show up at a very young age, and the reason the girls don't carry through is because the primary concern of the teenaged female is making herself interesting to boys. This includes, don't be smarter than the boy is. It is all right for a girl to display knowledgeable interest in masculine games such as baseball, but when she starts advising him about what's wrong with his car, she scares him off. Townsend herself didn't get trapped in that syndrome. In high school, she was too young for her male classmates to seriously regard her as a girl. And when she got to college, she encountered returning war veterans who tended to have more mature views about, uh, more mature views about females. Also, as an only child, she had long been accustomed to judging herself by the standards of adults. But Townsend thinks the day will not be long in coming when sex barriers to female professional achievements will be totally erased. She acknowledges a generally pleased attitude about life and says having a family or having a happy marriage has a lot to do with it. Her career has not prevented her from leading an active and varied family life. The Townsends have a commercial printing company in their basement, and they recently acquired an orange grove in, in Florida, for which she acts as accountant. They bought a mobile home for vacations and plan to spend a week at Disneyland in March and take a trip to Italy in the fall. Their four sons, aged 14, 18, 19, and 20, appear to be inclined toward following the family traditions. One has flirted with engineering and is thinking of going into caricature, er, <laughs> caricature, no, uh, going into citriculture, wow, very different word, citriculture, so that he can manage the family grove. Two others are headed respectively towards pediatrics and internal medicine. The 14-year-old hasn't yet mar mapped out his future. Townsend, meanwhile, is now plotting how, uh, sorry, Townsend, meanwhile, is now plotting how the SAS program can be kept alive after SASC is launched in 1975. She believes the SAS craft is the perfect satellite to do an infrared survey of the sky, the first of its kind. If the creativity, self-confidence, and determination that have marked her career have anything to do with it, the SAS program very likely has a lively future. Penned by Constance Holden. <laughs> oh boy. I mean, it's a very informative article, but 
you definitely get that 1970s bias. I don't know what this one's here for. Uh, oh, Reflections of a Warm Body by Marjorie R. Townsend, page 16. This is... Um, S E A S nineteen eighty four at George Washington University. I'm trying to remember what S E A S stands for. Let me see. I know it's engineering related. S E A S. Ah, okay. School of Engineering and Applied Science. So, George Washington University School of Engineering and Applied Science. Reflections of a Warm Body by Marjorie Rhodes Townsend, Bachelor of Electrical Engineering, 1951. <clears throat> I may not read the entire thing of this one. We'll see. But this is actual writing by her, so I may. Reflections of a Warm Body Almost 40 years ago, my classmates in thermodynamics class nicknamed me the hot body. I don't remember whether anyone called me that to my face, probably not, but everyone knew. Today we would call it sexual harassment. But it was meant as a friendly kind of teasing and the only female in, or, or it was meant as a friendly kind of teasing of the only female in the class. One of the good things about engineering education when I went to GWU was the requirement to take a variety of basic courses in other disciplines of engineering besides your own. It truly provided a solid base of education. For me, one of those courses was surveying. Evolution notwithstanding, I was truly a cold body when I took surveying during the winter term. We, like many students before us, surveyed or sorry, resurveyed the tract of land bordered by Military Road and Oregon Avenue. If one of my fellow students hadn't chased me around the field, guess what we would have called that today, I would probably have frozen to death hanging on a tripod. Both, of the, temperature, both the temperature and the equipment were very much in contrast to the time I wandered around a piece of Kenya with a surveying crew and their infrared sighting equipment almost 30 years later. But basic surveying skills learned at GWU stood the test of time. A pair of courses required of electrical engineering students in the 1940s was mechanical drawing and descriptive geometry. The former was easy, the latter gave me a lot of trouble. Descriptive geometry may have been the only course I ever dropped. The primary reason was the teacher. When he became perturbed with the students for any reason, he threw chalk at them. This seemed to be in lieu of teaching, and the classroom was a veritable missile ground. I always suspected he had some sort of problem. Descriptive geometry was also the class in which one student told jokes, which must have been absolutely filthy, although I was too naive then to understand them, just loud enough for me to hear. I matriculated in GW's School of Engineering at the ripe old age of 15 and a, ha and a, ha or 15 and a half in the fall term of 1945, having skipped several grades in elementary and junior high school. When I planned to go to the engineering school, I'd have done anything to avoid having to take history. My daddy told me I'd have to smoke big, black cigars at the engineer's smokers. But daddy always teased his only child. He was wrong, of course, and I have, in fact, lived to see the day when very little smoke curls upward when engineers get together. Logical people, engineers. Uh, they look at the statistics. Unlike many horror stories, I have heard of the mental, mental harassment accorded to other female students of my era. Other than the single incident of dirty jokes mentioned above, I can recall nothing unpleasant. The professors generally seemed to look upon me as a daughter, Aye. and the students, most of whom were returning World War II veterans, looked upon me as a younger sister. Many of them were married. 
and they were almost all very serious students bent upon getting their education. They simply didn't have time to bother about one stray female in their classes. That isn't to say that the teachers and students were not aware of me. How a teacher of electrical engineering happened to be talking about bastard files, I cannot recall. But I do remember how awkward the moment was when Professor Ames remembered I was in the class. I am sure a lot of the normal language was toned down when I was around. From studies done of women who studied, electrical, or who studied engineering in the early days, I seem to be typical. We, tended, we tend to be the oldest or the only children in a family with a close father-daughter relationship. Despite his teasing, my father encouraged me to study engineering and was very proud when I finally graduated, even though it was in a Catholic university gown. As usual, someone had fouled up, and the engineering school gowns sent to George Washington University for the big event had the right color hoods, but the Catholic university colors instead of buff and blue. On the other hand, my youth may have protected me from some of the less desirable parts of the engineering curriculum. In the electrical engineering lab, Professor Ames had a habit of testing the 220 volt line by touching it with two of his fingers to see if it was live. He would say, I can't feel anything. Would one of you boys like to try it? Some poor volunteer would try and then get zapped for his trouble. We always figured Deacon Ames had very dry fingers, but he could take that 220 volts without blinking an eye. Watching this must have created a major metamorphosis in my genetic structure since my eldest son used to take off his little belt and stick the prong into the electrical socket. This large charge for a small boy never seemed to bother him. I began my GWU education in 1945, but didn't get my degree until 1951. I had reckoned without meeting a young pre-med student by the name of Charles Chuck Townsend. Uh, whom I married in 1948. Years later, I learned that there was more than one bet made that I would get married and not finish school. At that time, those people betting that I wouldn't finish must have been feeling pretty sure of themselves. But one of the many blessings of GWU was that any course they offered was given at night. So I was able to work during the day and finish my last year at night, even though it took three years to do it. Many years later, one of our neighbors, upon learning that I had been married at 18, said, Oh, then Chuck is your second husband? I guess she assumed anyone married that young couldn't have known their own mind. But I also remember registering for classes in the fall of 1948 when someone called out, Mrs. Townsend! I spun around in answer and he said, just testing to see if you know your name. Funny man being, uh, funny man, of course I did. Now, after being married two thirds of my life, I can scarcely remember any other name. Unfortunately for me, I never learned to study before going to college, so I know I wasn't able to take full advantage of the education offered me. I had learned, however, how to participate in extracurricular activities, and I threw myself headlong into many of them, not the least of which was the, uh... I have absolutely no idea what that is. It is what this book is, though. M-E-C-H-E-L-E-E-C-I-V. Uh... McKellisiv? I'm not sure what it stands for. Not all of the back issues of McKellisiv are in the files, but I see my name as features editor of the February 1946 issue associated with McKellisiv. Also was Bernadine Dunphy, the only other woman taking engineering courses at GWU in those days. McKellisiv must have had a problem our editor probably graduated, or I never would have tackled being editor in my sophomore year, even for a few months. Sorry. It was a GWU periodical from the second school, or from, from the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Thank you, Kira. The GWU in-house engineering journal. Gotcha. Uh, I lost my place. I'm here. I can remember having the make ready all laid out on the ping pong table in the basement of my parents' home on Christmas Eve 1946 and dashing from one side of the table to the other trying to get it ready to reproduce. I believe that John uh, Slothower was there helping me. Other memories filter through 
through the years, sorority and fraternity parties, playing bridge in the student club and classes, and we all dressed like young ladies and gentlemen. A few years ago, when I was presented with one of GWU's coveted Alumni Association Achievement Awards at the February 1976 commencement, I was astounded to notice that one young woman, representing the best in her particular school, received the token diploma of wearing blue jeans and sandals under her black robe. The School of Engineering shared Corcoran Hall with the Chemistry and Physics departments. It had no attractive building of its own as it has now. Mechanical, electrical, and civil engineering, thank you. And uh, having it not all in caps, Millie Glitch, definitely makes it easier to, to make it out. Mechelisive. Uh, Corcoran Hall had no attractive building of its own as it has now. It was early in 1947 when Charles A. Tompkins donated 22500 to the university toward the construction of such a building. Small wonder it's called Thompson, Tompkins Hall. In the old electrical lab, I used to arrive early to get the experiment set up and checked out by the teacher. The whole plan was to be able to run the experiment after the rest of the team got there and get out early. Somehow it never worked out that way. After the rest of the team arrived, they tore it all down and set it up again, and then I was relegated to recording the data. Not reading it, just recording it. And I never got away early. I always liked to get my work done and out of the way, but not everyone is like that. On the day I got married, I went down to GWU to pick up my lab reports at the end of the semester, and one of my classmates was just turning his in. Given DC weather, I recommend wearing as little as possible under those robes if you're graduating in May or June. Indeed, Key Squared. <laughs> I graduated high school in uh, the DC suburbs in June, and yes, it's very hot under those robes. Uh, Bill Carley was one of those teachers who managed to intimidate the most fearless of students, but I'm one of those who was too dumb to be intimidated. Anyway, one day I came to class a little later than normal, only to find a red book lying open on my usual chair. Sitting down, I noticed that it was an engineering text written in French. Mr. Carly boomed, Mrs. Townsend, would you please read to us from that book? When I asked him whether he wanted it read in French or in English, he answered, in English. Little did he or any of my classmates know that I had studied French for six years and despite a fundamental lack of ability in languages, still knew the basics well. That, coupled with the international terminology of engineering terms, allowed me to translate the text and read it almost flawlessly, which I did absolutely deadpan. After two paragraphs of this, he said, also deadpan, that's enough. Thank you. From time to time, it was fun to try to get Margie, but that was one time it backfired. Needless to say, I have very warm memories of my days at GWU and of the many friends I made there. The women of today are more fortunate, perhaps. There are more role models. I had none, but of necessity I became one. It was 15 years later, after I received my BEE, that GWU graduated their first female BME, Bachelor of Mechanical Engineering. More years passed before there was any significant increase in the enrollment of female engineering students. Even 10 years ago, there were only eight, representing about 2% of the 344 students enrolled in undergraduate school. But fortunately, things are changing. Now there are about 16% women in C's, enough female classmates with whom to commiserate about some of the problems of being a minority group in an engineering world that is still populated primarily by men and enough to form the basis of an uh, old girls network equivalent to the very important old boys network that functions so well. And the men are more accepting. I find it very exciting. I've always felt women were a great untapped resource for engineering, and they are beginning to show that it's indeed true. Watch out, world. Here we come. Hostile environment. Yes. Needless to say, yeah, needless to say, I have very warm memories of my, I would not have warm memories of that personally. It seems like it wasn't a very welcoming environment and that she survived despite it. No ear for languages, but she's able to do technical reading uh, in French and translate it to English in real time. Uh, technical reading is an advanced skill, and then she picked up enough Italian for an acceptance speech, 
and, and in class was able to read in French real time without preparation. I think that's a little bit of self-deprecation. Yeah, and translate it. Nimbus spacecraft, let's see, data handling and communication problems. I'm, I'm looking through the folders to see. Last week, somebody asked about some of her speeches. Career Day Conference for Conference on Career Guidance in Science and Engineering for the Joint Boyd Board on Science Education. Possibly, possibly, possibly. Electronic Engineering and Systems Design of Spacecraft for Space Related Careers Conference. Leader for Engineering, Discussion Leader for Engineering Education and the Engineer in the Space Program for American Society of Engineering Education. There was something, ah, I believe this is the one that people wanted from last week. Women in Space Careers for Prince George's County S Science Fair, April 1967. Translation is very hard, especially if you have no ear for languages. They were definitely hazing her. So somebody last week asked about this one, but uh, it was in the box that was being used for a class last week. So I have to share it this week instead. <clears throat> Prince George's County Science Fair. Prince George's County is in Maryland, near Washington, D.C., in case you're unaware. Uh, Cole Field House, University of Maryland, April 16th, 1967. Women in Science Careers. As you can tell by the very gracious introduction, by that very gracious introduction, I qualify as one of the women with a space career. There are a number of us who are lucky enough to be working in one of the most fascinating fields possible, our nation's space program. Before I read further, I just wanted to see, oh, wow. So there's some handwritten notes. Um, and typed note cards for the um, thing. So I'm going to leave the handwritten notes up and just read the speech to you. Unless you want me to put the text of the speech up there. I can do that, too. Uh, <clears throat> Everything we do in space is new. It's being done for the first time ever. This is one of the reasons why it is such a thrill to be part of it. You might be surprised at the very wide variety of interests and in education needed by the people working in the space program. Space, or since the theme of the science fair this year is aimed at women, I think a brief look at what some of the women are doing will also show you the various types of jobs available to both men and women who want to get way out in spirit, at least. I think, too, let me see if I can get you both pages. I just think sometimes having me read to you what's on screen is, can be boring. Uh, sometimes it's great, sometimes it's boring, and since there's other stuff related to this speech in here, I can read to you the text of the speech while you look at the handwritten notes that are in some way related to the speech. I don't know exactly how they're related, uh, but these were the handwritten notes that were included in the same folder.
I think too, as you look around at some of the pictures on display, or if you know some of the people I'll talk about, you'll realize that the old pictures of the women in math, science, and engineering are out of date. It is not true that they look like Phyllis Diller with horn rimmed glasses. Some people have these old fashioned ideas though. There's another mistaken impression. That is that the college curriculum in these areas is so much harder. Surely it is difficult, but if you are interested in these more fascinating subjects, it is likely that the curriculum would not be as difficult for you as subjects you find dull. What I'm trying to say to everyone, but particularly, particularly to the girls in the audience, is don't let anyone talk you out of studying what you're interested in. <clears throat> Even if you decide in the end to stay home and raise babies, at least you'll be better equipped to help them with their homework. Science fairs are a wonderful way to find out if this sort of thing is fun for you, or drudgery. They provide a real opportunity for digging in and using your hands as well as your head. It's hard to explain the thrill of watching something you've put together actually work unless you've done it yourself. Since things almost never work the first time, the thrill is greatly, greatly amplified when they do work finally. I know a number of gals who are getting this sort of thrill almost every day. Sometimes it comes from a program that the computer eats without getting indigestion, sometimes from developing a theory that finally seems to make sense and will be proved or disproved someday, about the moon or one of our planets, or even about life way up in our own atmosphere, sometimes from nursing a space experiment until it flies and sends back real data answering questions raised by the theoreticians. There are some people at the Goddard Space Flight Center who thought that one of our gals was getting her thrills target shooting in the basement of Building 6. Actually, Judy Popowski is a mechanical engineer working with other engineers on tiny rockets that will be used to control the position of various spacecraft after they have reached their proper orbits. To move it around up there takes very little energy because there is no friction. One of our difficulties is to measure the Sever oh, is to measure the so very tiny thrusts. Uh, Judy was shooting a gun to generate shock waves for calibrating tiny pressure transducers to measure the chamber pressure in these very small rocket engines. While Judy is working with the problems of little rockets, another gal is very much involved with a bigger variety. This is Eleanor Presley, who is in charge of all uh, who is in charge of all of Goddard's sounding rockets. She has been through the rigors of many rocket launchings in the freezing cold of Fort Churchill, Canada, as well as burning heat of our own New Mexico desert. Eleanor started out with a degree in mathematics, but we've turned her into a working engineer. That's a pint-sized commercial, in case you didn't recognize it. Sounding rockets are used to carry experiments up through the atmosphere almost to orbital altitudes and return to Earth again. Many experiments are targeted first on these before they are put on satellites, or tested first on these before they're put on satellites. While I'm thinking about the experiments we do at Goddard, a few come immediately to mind. Edith Reed, who is a very competent physicist in our space sciences lab, is working with French scientists on an experiment to study our air flow. In fact, I wish she were here to tell you something about airflow. If you look at the horizon, I was, it doesn't actually say airflow. One second. This will be why they were launching her satellites from Kenya to get them into geosync without excessive orbital readjustment because they were still developing that. Yeah. So what's actually typed here is air glow, and reading on, I think maybe she actually did mean air glow. So let me reread re this part. Working with French scientists on an experiment to study our air glow. In fact, I wish she were here to tell you something about air glow. If you look at the horizon from up in space or from a high altitude balloon or sounding rocket, you can see a layer of atmosphere which glows. We are going to determine the cause from the various experiments underway. Another physicist at Goddard is Mary Tobin, whose chief interest is meteorological research. 
we are continuously developing new sensors to tell us more about the weather. Satellites look down from the top, but so far have not been able to tell us what's going on inside the atmosphere. Mary is working on some preliminary experiments from an airplane to try to measure the temperature vertically through the atmosphere by just looking down on top of it. This should provide some tremendously valuable information. I guess you've noticed how much preliminary work we do using airplanes, sounding rockets, and balloons before the experiments are flown on satellites. It allows us to learn more about their operation while we can still keep our hands on them. There are a couple of gals at Goddard who are not only playing with balloons, they run around chasing fireflies. Dr. Grace Lee Piccolo and Anne Marie Crawford are using the fireflies to detect adenosine triphosphate, ATP, a product of the atmosphere which is essential to all life as it is known on Earth. They plan to use certain chemicals from the firefly's tail lamp for the development of a life detection instrument, which will be used to determine whether there is life on other planets that is similar to the life we know on Earth. The planet we are most interested in is, of course, Mars. It is nearby, as planets go, and even though we've found that its atmosphere is much thinner than ours, it still might have life. We have a real cute astronomer at Goddard who is an expert on Mars. Her name is Jaylee Burley. While Jaylee is trying to find out just what the temperature, pressure, and constituents of the Martian atmosphere are, Winifred Cameron is studying a big piece of green cheese. Whoops! I guess we're pretty sure by now that the moon is not a piece of green cheese and that its environment is probably less hospitable than Mars might be, but Winifred hopes it will, uh, hopes it will help us, sorry, but Winifred hopes it will help to tell us how our solar system evolved. At the same time, Harriet Mallettson is studying the center of that same solar system, the big source of energy that controls our lives, the sun. She is particularly interested in one of the newest fields of astronomy, radio astronomy. Now that we can get beyond our atmosphere to look at the stars, there are whole new regions of astronomy to study, X-ray, gamma ray, and infrared astronomy just for a beginning. There may be untold numbers of sources radiating energy that we cannot see in addition to all of the stars we can see even with our naked eye on a clear night. While I find the work of these gals absolutely fascinating, I can't help but think of the one thing that makes space travel, both manned and unmanned, possible. None of our space exploration would be possible without the development of the big computers. Melba Roy heads a group of programmers whose job is to make these big computers do their rapid fire calculations of satellite orbits and then force them to handle the experiment data that the satellites spit out 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know, the astronauts may get a chance to sleep in orbit, but our experiments never do. They work all the time. If we had to do the calculations by hand that the computer does, a lifetime wouldn't be enough. Most of our gals working in computer programming have a background in mathematics, but a degree in physics is often necessary to understand the experiments which are flown on the satellites. Unless the operation of the experiment is completely understood, it is not possible to feed its characteristics into the computer. As I said, without the computers and the people who know how to talk to them, there just wouldn't be any space program. It isn't possible to cover all the areas of the space program in which there are women working. I have limited my brief review to just a few of the gals at the Goddard Space Flight Center, ignoring completely the other NASA centers, NASA headquarters, other government agencies, and industry. Nor have I talked about the unlimited opportunities available to men and women alike in the very great assortment of jobs in math, science, and engineering. There is so much variety. You are bound to find the one that seems to be there just for you. Of course, there are some people who aren't interested in the kinds of fun and games we play. I even have one in my own family. Dr. Owens thought you might be interested in meeting them, so I asked them to come in with me or to come with me today. First and foremost, my husband, Dr. Charles Townsend, who is an obstetrician, in addition to his private practice, he is medical director of Planned Parenthood and a regular lecturer on the subject out here at the University of Maryland. My eldest son, Chet, is 15 and in ninth grade at Alice Deal Junior High School, where he is chairman of the projection crew. He is a patrol leader in his Boy Scout troop. He is a member of the St. Sievers Guild at the St. Albans Church and is a life scout with 15 merit badges. Uh... 
oh, sorry, he is a member of the Saints, uh, Saint Severs Guild at the Saint Albans Church, and has a star paper route. He intends to study medicine. The rest of his time is devoted to being the principal stockholder and general manager of the Townsend Printing Company. This establishment in our basement offers the best in letterpress printing. Uh, that's a commercial too. My second son. <laughs> I don't. I don't understand why suddenly at this science fair where she was asked to talk about science careers for women in space. Suddenly, she brings in her family and talks about them. I'm not certain why that happened, but I will continue reading. My second son, Lewis, is 13 and in the eighth grade at Alice Steele. He is also a member of the projection crew. He is assistant Boy Scout patrol leader and a life scout with 14 merit badges. He also is on the St. Saint Ser Servers Guild at St. Albans, and he too has a star paper route. Oh, remember the days when kids could have paper routes? That was my first job. Uh, he was another ho he has another hobby, however. He now is both mother and father to a five-month-old Irish setter named Sally, whom he is training very well. He's found that it's a bit of a job raising a youngster. It should be very good experience because he says he wants to be a pediatrician. My number three son, John, is 12 and in seventh grade at Alice Deal. He is my... This is my year for students in the ninth, eighth, and seventh grades. Not only do we have all the grades covered at Deal, but we really do have the projection crew covered because John also is a member. He is a Boy Scout, presently at star level and waiting for the board of review to w within the next month when he too will be a Life Scout. He has 12 merit badges. He is waiting out confirmation year and oasis between the junior and senior servers guilds at St. Albans. John plans to be a lawyer. I mentioned that there was one of us who had interests other than science. Last but not least is Richard, nine years old and in third grade at Phoebe Hurst School. He's waiting out the next two years till he too can join the Scouts. He is on the Junior Servers Guild at St. Albans and says he wants to study engineering and become an astronaut. One of my boys can cook and among them do all the family grocery shopping. All of my boys can cook, and among them do all the family grocery shopping. In case you can't tell, I'm pretty proud of them all, and I'm always delighted for the chance to show them off. Thank you. Because they have to appeal to everybody. I mean, honestly, um, yeah, it could be just to be relatable. I'm not certain. Um, but I could definitely have imagined my mom doing something like that if she had gone to give a talk somewhere. Although my mom was not a spectacularly accomplished uh, engineer working in, a spa in the space program. Um, that's not to say that my mom did not have an excellent career of her own. <laughs> I did not mean to imply that, but uh, it definitely wasn't in the space program. Oh, let's see what else we have. We have another one of her talks, if you're all interested in that. Space-Related Careers, a conference sponsored by National Aeronautics and Space Administration and the Drexel in Institute of Technology, March 29th, 1966. This is the program for it. <laughs> well, Key Squared, there is a VOD, um, and eventually these go up on YouTube on the Virginia Tech University Library's YouTube channel. So uh, if you ever want to pop back in and um, see what you've missed, uh, they will be there. Um, after the VODs disappear from Twitch, they'll, they'll show up on the Virginia Tech Library's YouTube channel. And honestly, if I have time, they'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> Let's see. 
more handwritten notes for a speech. Let's see. Actually, that might be the, the speech. There might not be a typed thing. Dear Mrs. Townsend, enclosed you will find a copy of the program as we sent it to the printer. You will note that the faculty representative to serve with you in the afternoon seminar meeting has not yet been named. We have sent invitations to selected high school students and we are hopeful that the replies will be as encouraging as they were in past years. I feel certain that we will have an interesting and challenging meeting and I appreciate the contribution you are making to it. In looking over the program, you will see that there are seven speakers for the general session. If you and the others on the program can limit your morning remarks to 15 or 20 minutes without doing harm to your presentation, I would greatly appreciate it. I am hoping that this will be sufficient time to present your ideas in such a way as to provide an interesting and enthusiastic discussion in the afternoon seminar. I am listing a topic as one given to me either by you or by Mr. Boyle of NASA. We are planning a dinner at the Drexel Activities Center located on the southwest corner of 32 and Chestnut Streets for 6.30 p.m. on the evening of March 28th for all participants in the, in the conference. This will give us an opportunity to get acquainted and to make any final changes necessary in the program. If you would like me to make hotel reservations for you, I would be pleased to do so. Again, may I say how much I appreciate your willingness to contribute to the program and I look forward to meeting you on the 28th. Sincerely yours, Donald E. Bynaman, Dean of Admissions, Drexel Institute of Technology. Um, let's see. All right, I will show you. You guys can look at the original handwritten version uh, in pencil, and I will look at the photocopy of the handwritten version in pencil because I do not have a typed up version as, of this. So this might take me a little bit more effort to read. We'll see. As you have heard, those of us on the platform today are oriented toward research, specifically toward space research, to be sure. But there are a couple of fundamentals which apply to all fields of research in science and engineering. First, tomorrow's researcher will need graduate training at least a master's degree and preferably a doctorate. This may be an annoying thought at this point in your education, but you should be aware of it. Second, there is an increasing need for interdisciplinary knowledge. For example, biology and electrical engineering. Uh, one problem that needs solving is measure the action that takes place during the growth of a leaf. Uh, when you do basic or applied research, you have some tough problems to solve indeed, but there are some rather thrilling compensations. You are working on materials or you are working on materials or something that have never existed before. I'm not sure what that word is. Uh, you can create something entirely new. This is doubly true in a new field like space exploration. For example, I designed a new type of digital telemetry system which will fly for, uh, which will fly for the first time next month. I have my fingers crossed that it will be successful. In space, we really only have one or two chances, so you have to design right the first time. It takes a lot of small systems to make one large spacecraft system. The first thing you need is a power supply. I don't know if there's more. There doesn't appear to be any more to the speech. It started off really cool, but the, it ends. I, it seems like it goes to another page, but I don't have any more of it. I am so sorry.
That was everything in this folder. I don't have the rest of that speech. <laughs> It was very interesting. The mention of um, interdisciplinary uh, research, <laughs> there's still, today, I work in academia. Um, I work at a place with an engineering program. And still today, there's, we need more interdisciplinary stuff. Um, I actually, put together some stuff a couple of years ago for a, an interdisciplinary course where students um, were envisioning and working through as like a thought experiment how to colonize Mars. And they had to, they had interdisciplinary projects, they had to basically create uh, an entire Mars colonization program. And that was the whole course. It was an interdisciplinary uh, class that was offered jointly between like three different um, portions or three different schools in the university. And I ended up getting involved because they were, uh, the, the professor was looking at Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy of science fiction novels. Um, as kind of background to prepare. And I know those novels really, really well. They're some of my favorites. And uh, he came to Special Collections because we have a copy of those here and um, wanted to uh, gain access to it to be able to look through it. And I kind of summarized for him a lot of what it was. And he had actually had me come and guest lecture the class about um, colonization of Mars as represented in literature and science fiction, uh, which was a really interesting uh, class. Um, one of the, my favorite things that I've done since I started working here was getting to guest lecture on Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars trilogy to a class that was focused on Mars colonization. Um, it, it was a lot of fun. I think we have time for maybe one more. What is this? This is a... Six talks about small astronomy satellites. Maybe there's something more interesting. Let's see. Elements of telemetry. Speech not in folder. I just blinded myself a second ago. The, the lights, I looked too directly at them. Speech for Zonta Clubs of Metropolitan Washington. Press conference prior to launch of SASB. Ooh. <laughs> I've got two of them. Two of them that seem really interesting. I'm going to put this one away. I'm sure it would have been interesting too, but, but these seem really interesting and we only have about 15 minutes left. So uh, we will start with box one, folder 19, remarks for Federal Women's Award Banquet, March 1973. We have a copy of... I'm trying to see why this is in here. I don't know why this copy of the Goddard News is in here. I, I'm really not certain. Unless something to do with the Snoopy Awards is the federal women's I will leave you with a lovely picture here. It's one of the recipients, one of the people talked about earlier. I don't know.
But I have a <clears throat> remarks for the Federal Women's Awards Banquet. I'm wondering if the Snoopy Awards is the Federal Women's Award. But I'm not certain. Uh, March 6, 1973, Marjorie R. Townsend. When I was a very little girl, my mother kept trying to make me say thank you to people. I never could get it across to her way. Uh, I, I never could get it across to her why I thought it was unnecessary. She, uh, she obviously could read my mind. She had proved this often enough. That, therefore, must be a characteristic of grown-ups, and so it surely wasn't necessary to verbalize it. I feel somewhat like that little girl again tonight. We all know that being selected for the Federal Woman's Award is a very great honor, and we all know that I didn't get to this point all by myself. As the astronauts have so frequently stated, far more eloquently than I, our work at NASA is a team effort. This is quite true of the Small Astronomy Satellite uh, Project. I simply have had the great good fortune to have been selected as the leader of that team, by my, but my team extends beyond work. As any married woman knows well, her successful career must include a lot of cooperation at home. My guests here tonight include a major part of the total team from both work and home that have made it possible for me to stand on this platform, and to them I give simply my heartfelt thanks. I was indeed fortunate to have been selected to manage a spacecraft project that has truly revolutionized astronomy. It is brought to you by 40 microcents per year of your tax dollar. That is 40 millionths of one penny. X-ray astronomy is a relatively young science, but after two years in orbit, the first of the SAS series, which is better known as Uhuru, has astronomers all over the world waiting with bated breath for its next discoveries in the heavens. Man has always been fascinated by the stars, but never more than now when we know that there are invisible stars radiating far more energy than most of the visible ones. Now that SAS-2, which is looking for sources emitting the very highest energy radiation, gamma rays, gamma rays has joined SAS-1 in orbit, we have the opportunity to study the formation of stars and from that to learn more about the evolution of the universe itself. Tonight, as a career employee of the federal government, I am given a great honor. But almost 25 years working for Uncle Sam has given me a lot more. It has given me an interesting, no, a fascinating life on the forefront of research from the bottoms of the oceans to the reaches of outer space. With its liberal leave policy, it has permitted me to have four children, plus the mumps and various other diseases that my sons brought me home from school, all without taking any leave without pay. With all that, I still have available well over six months sick leave. The government has sent me to various places in the continental United States and to Bermuda, England, France, Switzerland, Italy, Uganda, and Kenya as well. It has broadened my education both formally and informally with universities and on-site courses as well as continuous on-the-job training. All in all, it's a very exciting life and tonight is indeed one of, the, one of its most exciting moments. Thank you. So I'm guessing if I had spent more time poking through this, there's probably a picture of her uh, getting that award. But I was a little hurried because I wanted to be able to get to as much stuff as I can in the time we have remaining. This one seems interesting. Press conference prior to the launch of SASB, September 27th, 1972. So, what is that, 49 years ago? Possibly, if, if my brain did the math correctly. <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and read this one. I don't know, this might be the last one I do. Uh, unless somebody sees something in the finding aid that they really, really want to see, because I can, I can always do that. Um, I have a little bit of leeway. 
As we've discussed, the series of small astronomy satellites is primarily for studying the celestial sphere in the high energy parts of the electromagnetic magnetic spectrum. Dr. Fichtel, who is the project scientist for SAS and also the principal investigator for SASB, will discuss the scientific aspects of the program shortly. First, however, I wanted to discuss some of the philosophy of the SAS program and some specifics of the spacecraft control section, that is, the half of the spacecraft that provides the support functions for the experiment. As a part of NASA's Explorer series of small, relatively inexpensive satellites, an important aspect of the SAS philosophy is to keep the cost down. To achieve this, we have designed the spacecraft control section separate from the experiment. Thus, without redesigning the spacecraft, we can reproduce the spacecraft control section and place a different experiment on top. Eliminating this redesign saves time and money. With SAS A and B, we have proved that this concept will work. Now to talk briefly about how the spacecraft control section functions to support the needs of the experiment. Little spacecraft have all the same requirements of big spacecraft, although it may be on a smaller scale. They all must have power, command, capability, telemetry, and a control system. Now that we are in our second decade of the space program, even the small satellites are pretty sophisticated. Look, for example, at what SAS can do with only 27 watts average power. This power, by the way, is obtained from solar cells and rechargeable nickel-cadmium batteries provided, uh, provide our power through the nighttime portion of the orbit. Through the onboard command system, we can, by ground command, tell it where to point, when to turn on the experiment, when to play back the onboard tape recorder, and generally, through 36 relay commands, turn virtually everything in the spacecraft and experiment on and off individually. All this is done as it passes over the NASA station at Quito, uh, Quito Ecuador. During the time when it is out of sight, we have a tape recorder on the satellite that records all the data acquired during an entire orbit. When it passes over the ground station, we speed up the tape recorder by a factor of 20 and play back in five minutes all the data collected during the entire 96-minute orbit, thus receiving 100% of the information seen by the satellite. In between passes over the ground station at Quito, the transmitter continues to transmit data as it is acquired so that we can record, record it on the ground at various spots around the equator. This is a real advantage if the tape recorder should cease to function as it did on SASA. Then we ask for help from other stations located on the, uh, on the equator, such as the ones the French have at Kourou and uh, Brazzaville. The heart of the SAS spacecraft is its control system, a dual spin con configuration. Using a wheel inside the spacecraft provides the stability we need, allowing us to de-spin the outer shell even down to zero if we so desire. The SAS, on SASB, we plan to rotate the outer body of the spacecraft at one, in, uh, one, to, sorry, one twelfth RPM just as we have on SAS-1. The magnetic torquing system is the other key part of the control system. By turning an electric on electromagnets inside the spacecraft, we can torque it to a point anywhere in the sky. Uh, it acts just like a compass needle trying to point north. With the help of our ground computer, we know when to turn it on and off to point anywhere we need to. By torquing against the Earth's magnetic field in this fashion, we never run out of gas, since the Earth's mag magnetic field is always there. The Applied Physics Laboratory of the Johns Hopkins University, the prime contractor for the SAS spacecraft control section, is world-renowned as having the leading experts in the field of magnetic control. To summarize the SAS program as of now, SAS-1 Uhuru is flying and has made revolutionary discoveries in the field of X-ray astronomy. Dr. Carl Fichtel, who will follow me at the podium, will talk about his gamma-ray experiment we are about to fly on SASB and SASC, scheduled for the spring of 1975, will fly a composite of four X-ray experiments more, more sophisticated than SAS-1 that are being designed at MIT under the leadership of Professor George Clark. If you have 
uh, if you have enough time after Dr. Fichtel's presentation, I thought I would discuss why we have chosen to fly from the Italian's San Marco launch platform off the coast of Kenya. I have brought some view graphs that show what it is like there and some of the interesting differences we encounter when launching there instead of from the continental United States. I want, I want that part of it. <laughs> That part does not is not in this folder. It it's possible that it might be somewhere else in the collection, but it's not in this folder. But that sounds really interesting. I, I'd love to know why why they launch from San Marco instead of from the US and uh, see what those view graphs are. I'm not certain what view graphs even are. But um, I don't know. I have four minutes left. I can try and do one more. Or two more. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> uh, this is a letter, the Continuing Education for Women Center at the George Washington University. October 24th. 1973 is the date stamped here. The letter is dated October 18th, 1973. Uh, it is addressed to Mrs. Marjorie R. Townsend, code 701.4, NASA, Goddard Space Flight Center, Greenbelt Road, Greenbelt, Maryland, 20771. You have two view graph projectors in your office right now? That's awesome, Key Squared. I may have seen one. I I'll have to look at, now I have to look and see what they are. What is a view graph? I don't know what they look like. Everything that I'm seeing is like modern projectors and I know that that's wrong. And a general Google search just give me gives me charts. It's not the proprietary whatever view graph is. Oh, just, oh, I didn't know that's what they were. I didn't know that's what they were named. Transparency projectors. I know what those are. I We have those. I actually have, in many of our collections, we have transparencies. I did not know it was called a view graph projector. So that's just a, like, I didn't know that was the name of it. I assumed it was something else. <laughs> like, I, I have multiple collections that just have the, the printed transparencies in them. Um, and we've got projectors in the building. And I've used them before. Like, I just, I did not know that that's what it was. I did not know that was the name. Okay, I'm going to finish reading this letter. Thank you for accepting our invitation to speak to women students of the Developing New Horizons for Women classes at George Washington University on Tuesday, October 30th. The meeting will begin at 10 a.m. and will terminate at 12.30. It will be held at the Marvin Center, 21st and H Streets, North uh, Northwest, in the ballroom on the third level. I hope that you'll be able to be our guest for lunch immediately following. Just a simple little thank you letter saying, thank you for agreeing to speak to uh, women students. I, I was excited by it because it was another women students thing, but a pioneer woman blazes the trail in engineering for National Secretaries Association.
She gave a talk for the NSA, National Secretaries Association. And now your confusion is assuaged because you th thought that you remembered me using one on a st on stream. Oh, I have um, I have a document camera. It's similar, but I don't. I had a light box that I used on stream. I haven't used a, a transparency projector on stream, but. National Secretaries Association Banquet, May 18th, 1974. This will be the last thing I read. A pioneer woman blazes the trail in engineering. I've been asked to give, to give you tonight a sort of autobiography or answers to the two questions that I've been asked the most frequently over the years. How did a nice girl like you get into a business like this? And what's it like to be a woman in an all-male world? Uh, and then, so these are speech notes, not an actual speech. Um, so bullet point A is she wants to talk about her four sons at home and then to contrast that with her husband in an all-female world, but he isn't asked uh, because he's an obstetrician. Uh, and then talk about school, curriculums, maturity of students, $10 bet. I'm curious about what that story is. Alternatives for, for women, blinders, masculine characteristics, career without marriage. Actually, I've managed to have children, a career, marriage, children. As the first woman graduate from the George Washington University School of Engineering, I guess I do qualify for the title we gave tonight's talk, A Pioneer Woman Blazes the Trail in Engineering. And then so just some more notes. She moves on from there to talk about marriage, uh, then to talk about her experience at the Naval Research Laboratory. Under that is children, and under that is sewage plant, cafeteria garbage, change in workload as function of number, 250 versus power supply, and then measles, followed by sonar school, closed door, presentation to top brass, <coughs> out on DE. Back at NRL, when I was out on the DE, supervisory experience, first bad, second good, and then Goddard Space Flight Center, soldering iron, uh, and then as supervisor, logical woman, would you work for me again? Sensitivity, people listen to a man, pretend to be secretary, ignored, sometimes nice to be a woman and spoiled, house at San Marco. Huh. So, no actual like full text of a speech, uh, but notes for what was going to be a speech to the National Secretaries Association. Um, it's really interesting looking at her speeches uh, that she gave to various organizations about women in um, in the sciences and in engineering and stuff like that. I think. I think those are pretty cool. Um, that said, uh, that is that is where we're going to end it today. Um, I, there is plenty more in this collection. Um, I think she's she's rather fascinating as a figure, and I'm happy to have discovered that this is part of our collections here. Um, however. Uh, today is the last day, at least for a while, that we're going to look at this one. Going forward, uh, next Wednesday is the first Wednesday in October, and I plan to pull out something spooky, something creepy, something odd from our collections every Wednesday in October. Uh, I know for sure at least one of the streams I will be sharing um, the various collections that we have that have human hair in them. Um, so that will be coming and we'll look at, uh, a lot of people find the human hair creepy. It's honestly not, but we'll, we'll look at it and see why is it there and uh, what I mean by human hair in a collection and, and 
So there's that. Uh, we do have like old English, or sorry, old British and old American literature. Um, so I may see if I can find some scary stories that I can read on stream. Uh, some like early horror stories or something like that. Also, we have some pulp sci-fi stuff that might qualify for for that, um, and that may be old enough for me to be able to read on stream. So that's kind of the plan for October. Um, <laughs> Millie Glitch, I'm glad you stopped by. I hope it was interesting. And yeah, this is what I do on Wednesday afternoon. Um, that said, I think, let me see who we can raid. Um, I did a quick look and I didn't see anybody immediately pop out. Let me just look on my phone. Oh, they are live. Okay. Uh, so we are going to head over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, which is where I typically like to go at the end of this stream, just because we go from educational to really chill and educational as well. Um, they are today doing jellyfish, so if anybody is not cool with jellyfish, just a warning there. Um, they have the jellyfish cam on today, but I hope that you enjoyed the stream today, and I will um, hope that I see you again on another Wednesday Archival Adventures stream, uh, either on twitch.tv slash vtulstudios or twitch.tv slash rogan27, Wednesdays at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. I will... Uh, Hope to see you again in the future and uh, say hi when you get over to Monterey Bay Aquarium. <laughs>